Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin, and today we're discussing the new future of work. We've covered the future of work in the past. It was actually episode five of Hence the Future, but so much has changed since then. Pre-existing trends have massively accelerated. Entirely new trends have emerged. And the nature of what it means to have a job and to earn a living is evolving rapidly. There may be no normal to go back to after this travel ban and lockdown is lifted. We must instead adapt and evolve to this new paradigm shift now and in the future. So before we get into everything that's changing in the job market and how we should position ourselves, let's remind ourselves of what the world looked like just six weeks ago. So the old world pre-COVID was one where you went to school you learned how to follow instructions, how to memorize facts, how to do well in exams. And most of that training is really sort of teaching you how to be a factory worker or perhaps a middle manager at a company or really a cog in the machine. You're not really learning how to be someone who's adaptable and able to create new businesses and navigate uncharted waters. It's You're really learning how to be someone who can follow instructions and do one small part of a much larger whole. So after school, you would get a job at a company, you'd work hard, you'd try to move up the ladder, you'd save some money for retirement. And often at work, they really require you to be in the office from nine to five, regardless of how efficient you are at getting work done. You could be carrying the company, but if you're, you know, if you leave work an hour early, oftentimes you'd get penalized. And, you know, some people who are good at sort of schmoozing and they say the right things in meetings and they go to work at the right time and leave late, those people will often be rewarded, even if the underlying work they're doing isn't that meaningful in the organization. And because you had to be in the office for this time, there's this sort of phenomenon of work theater. And some people would get penalized, like, you know, oftentimes if you start having kids and you need to take them to school and that sort of thing, you'd get penalized because you're not in the office as part of the work theater performance as everyone else. People would also, in the historic world pre-COVID, they'd fly across the country to meet people in person. You know, they'd, they'd shake hands, they'd talk about partnerships, they'd expense their airfare, their hotels, their expensive meals. And in the, this economy, if you didn't save enough money, you would be in trouble, you'd lose your job, and you could go on unemployment benefits, but really you'd only keep those benefits if you kept looking for work and were still unable to find a job, which, you know, that in itself is pretty unrealistic given that nowadays anyone can go on the internet onto Upwork or Fiverr or dozens of other sites and find some sort of work. Um, So this reality had already started to change before the COVID crisis began. You know, there was candidates like Andrew Yang who would talk about this and people kind of treated him as someone who was, you know, maybe not the most ground in reality and was perhaps projecting too much into the future. But times already were starting to change. Workers were needing to constantly reinvent themselves. People couldn't depend on being in the same job or the same company for 20 or 30 years. They'd have to change every few years. There were already concerns around automation, around manufacturing, moving outside of the U.S., um, around income inequality, around joblessness, um, you know, malls were closing. Change was already in the air, but before COVID, the bubble hadn't burst yet. You know, job numbers were continuing to climb until just about two weeks ago. You know, I was listening to the Planet Money episode from this week, and They've always released an episode of Jobs Friday where they give the recent job numbers. And from the time Planet Money started as a podcast, that was always a, an exciting, positive announcement about Jobs Fridays because the unemployment numbers were always going down, jobs were going up, companies were hiring, markets were going up. Now fast forward to today. The economy has ground to a halt. 10 million people have filed for unemployment benefits in just the last two weeks alone, which is the fastest rise in jobless claims in U.S. history. And we released a GIF of this on 
hence the Futures Twitter account. And you can see the scale of jobless claims in the past few weeks dwarfs anything else that we've seen in the, in the history of America. Supply chains are also fraying as factories are needing to shut down to prevent spread of the virus and tensions between the U.S. and China are, are escalating at the same time. Demand has dropped across the board because people are tightening their belts and they're saving their cash because they're preparing mentally and financially for a recession or even a depression. You know, China has started to reopen some of their factories and some of their businesses, but they still aren't able to create that international demand that was there before the crisis. So even if China is able to operate at full speed, the demand may just not be there in the international community, and it's unclear when that demand will return. Uh, likewise, prices are crashing in the bond market, in the equity market, in the housing market, in the oil market. Currencies are being devalued around the world because countries are needing to print money and go deeper into a debt in an attempt to stimulate their economies and really just to prevent people from going bankrupt and businesses from going under. And millions of young people who previously had a, you know, quote unquote, safe career path that they had all planned out with their expensive tuition and their, you know, their 10 year plan, they're having to rethink their plans entirely because the economy is changing so fast. And unless the government seriously steps in or people adapt in an unprecedented way, there are going to be many people who will be left behind. So. Before we get into solutions and what you can do for yourself, I thought it might be helpful to give a few real world examples that I'm seeing in my own life and you know, perhaps that can provide some value to you. So I have one friend who works at a production company in LA and he got laid off because the company simply isn't able to produce. They can't film on set, they can't get together because of the shelter in place rules. So their revenue went to zero and he's now thinking of maybe starting his own production company. But of course, that's a little bit difficult now uh, until the lockdown is lifted. I have another friend who works at an e-commerce company that actually is doing well because so many people are home and they have time on their hands and they're shopping as a way of perhaps staying sane. So their company is actually doing great, but he's getting laid off as well because the company has realized that they really need to focus on profitability as opposed to growth. And they're sort of using the COVID crisis as cover so they can lay off anyone who's not purely necessary for profitability. I have another friend who works at a crowdfunding company that's doing very well because they raised money just before the crisis and their whole platform is, uh, you know, something that will do well in the new world economy. It doesn't require lots of overhead. It's really people funding ideas amongst themselves. It's a platform. And that company CEO is keeping everyone on staff and he's even giving raises to the lowest earning employees so that they have a bit of extra discretionary income in case they have unforeseen medical expenses uh, amidst COVID. So there are some companies that are responding well. I wanted to give that example. Apple also is continuing to pay all their employees. So they're, they're doing well uh, by society also. I have another friend who's currently in college, a few friends actually who are in college, but this one friend has said that online classes are a complete joke. You know, their parents are paying 50,000 a year or whatever it is, and they're getting substandard education through online classes, which really the kids would probably be better off just watching YouTube videos. And he's realizing that there's no sure bets in planning a career. So he's looking to join a startup and do some work aside and outside of school so he can become more anti-fragile in this new economy. I have another friend who's got a secure job as a lawyer. Um, so he's pretty much set, you know, he's not going to have any disruption for the next, whatever, 10 years, but he finds this work meaningless and unfulfilling and he wants a change. He wants to do something different. So even though he could be considered one of the lucky ones with all of this economic turmoil, he's also looking to make a change. I have another friend who works in academia. She's trying to be a professor and she just learned that they have frozen all hiring of new professors this year, 
which means that next year when the lockdown is lifted, she'll be competing against twice as many people for the same few coveted professor slots. And then I, finally, I have another friend who works as a manager at a restaurant and that restaurant's now closing down entirely and he's moving back in with his parents and figuring out what to do. So there are so many different responses and so many different effects depending on what company it is and what your job is. But there has not been a single person who's been totally unaffected by this. It really does have implications across the board. And I'll give a couple industry examples of how industries are changing from my view. Is that may be helpful as well. So let's use an ad agency as an example. You know, that's what I run. I run a marketing agency called Noble Growth. And in the past, like even five, ten years ago, and this is even true to some degree today, an ad agency would have an account manager, they'd have sales reps, they'd have media buyers, they'd have copywriters, creative directors, graphic designers, photographers, they'd have an accountant, uh, HR, they would have all of these people. Whereas now, one person can fill all of those roles with just the help of some software and maybe you know you use Upwork to fill in a few gaps and key roles. So it may still make sense to you know, hire a copywriter or a designer for your agency, but you shouldn't only hire that as just like one small cog in the machine. You're much better if you can collaborate with a few people who are able to leverage their skills and do far more than one person could typically do. And that's really what's become possible with technology. So Noble Growth runs a really, you know, modern ad agency where we just have a few key team members. You know, I pretty much run all of our marketing strategy, media buying, a lot of our creative. I've got another member of the team who does all of our social engagements, and video editing, and another member who does all of our development, programming, data science. And between the three of us, we're able to do what most, you know, 20 person agencies would do five years ago. So this is massively changing. And I can't imagine that a lot of the, you know, big, you know, 20 plus person ad agencies are going to survive in the next five to 10 years. Likewise, let's take a more traditional example of a restaurant. You know, it used to be the case that to have a successful restaurant, you just need good food, a good location, good service. And it was sort of a, if you build it, they will come mentality for if you ran a good restaurant, you would get demand and that's what it took to succeed. Now, not only do you still have to have all of those parts, you also need to have good SEO on Yelp and Google Business because that's how a lot of people find out about good restaurants. Also smaller apps like Infatuation. And you also need an efficient way to get takeout and delivery, especially now under lockdown. So you gotta do partnerships with Postmates and Grubhub and Caviar and whoever else. And you need to do enough business in delivery to cover all of your brick and mortar expenses. And one way to just illustrate how much this space is changing is that there is now the emergence of what are called cloud kitchens, where there's no brick and mortar store at all. There's no actual restaurant. There's just an online you know, a website and a menu where you can order food. And then they have you know, low cost kitchens in various parts of major cities that cook up this stuff and then you know delivery people pick it up and deliver it to you without there actually being anywhere where you can sit down and eat your food and they've chosen places that have really low rent so they have low overhead expenses and pretty much all of their revenue comes from online sales and, and phone sales so those are a few examples of just how much a few industries are changing now i want to talk about the future what should you do to prepare for the new future of work? We'll take a quick break and then we'll get into that. Let's start with the best case scenario. Best case scenario. Some trends that are accelerating that are good. One is Medicare for all. So Biden recently tweeted that no one should have to pay for coronavirus testing and treatment. And then someone who I follow on Twitter crossed out coronavirus and said, oh, there, I fixed it for you. 
And I thought this was so funny because it seems absurd to say as your political stance that no one should have to pay for coronavirus testing and treatment, but you should have to pay for, let's say, cancer testing and treatment. It, it, it really shows some weaknesses in the, in the capitalist system if you're only able to pay for some medical expenses and not others. So it very much seems like there's a shift happening right now where there's more and more support for Medicare for all. And actually, Trump recently made some remarks that show that he may look into expanding people's access to health care, which is kind of a, 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 an insane shift if you think about it. You know, Democrats have always been really pushing Medicare for all. And now with a Republican president in a crisis situation and a Republican-led Senate, it may actually be the perfect recipe for actually getting things done in this regard. So whatever you think about Trump and the Republican-led Senate, this may be one of those rare uh, you know, instantiations in history where we're able to get monumental legislation passed because the GOP has pretty good instincts and they know what needs to happen in order to save the economy and to really save their own reputations and keep themselves in power. So that, that's a good thing, right? We may get health care and better health care coverage for at least more Americans than currently have it. Likewise, it looks like UBI, universal basic income, is becoming more and more popular. The Senate already passed $2 trillion uh, stimulus package, which will give $1,200 to individuals who earned less than 75k and that is some sort of it's like a one-time ubi payment but the good thing is that the worse the economy gets and the worse the crisis gets the more likely it is that the senate and trump will pass true ubi recurring payments even if it's just for a few months you know ideally it would be you know just ongoing every month for the foreseeable future because that would really shift psychology and really get people to start spending and perhaps take some bigger risks, start new startups and that sort of thing. So those are both good trends in the sense that even if you're not able to adjust your skill set and you know you know find new work in this new paradigm, there is a good chance that you'll have better support than Americans have had in the past. One thing I would say just as far as how industries are changing in response to this, I think the move away from growth and towards profitability is a good one. That really lays a good foundation for real meaningful growth, meaningful inventions. And we've already seen a lot of innovation uh, since this started, especially in biotechnology. We've gotten way better at tracking viruses, how they evolve, sequencing the genome of viruses. We've gotten better at building ventilators in creative ways. Companies are changing their factories to start building ventilators and masks. And there's innovation across the board because every company is having to adjust. So I think a lot of great inventions are going to be created in the wake of this, just like how a lot of inventions were created after the Great Depression. Another good scenario and trend that I'm seeing, uh, it has good and bad elements, but I think the decoupling between the US and China is a good trend because it will bring back some jobs to the US and it'll also just make America more resilient because we're not focused on one supplier for all of our pharmaceuticals, all of our computers, all of our phones, all of our retail clothes. We will instead have multiple sources uh, for these products in our supply chain. And it also means we would push back on human rights violations. And the U.S. has really sort of turned a blind eye to all of the human rights violations in China because they're so important to our economy. I think once we start decoupling, we'll be able to you know, criticize them more and push more for the proper treatment of minorities in China and you know, not overstepping human liberties. I would also say that a good scenario is that there's affordable housing, there's affordable equities, and those are especially good for young people because they'll be able to get in on the market at a more affordable uh, price. And finally, I'd say that a best case is that 
you know, the remote work trend is really sort of blurring the lines between work and play. And I think that will sh make people want to do what is really in line with their passion. So imagine that instead of going to school to be a factory worker, you're really going to school to self-actualize. You're going there to discover what it is that you love to do, what it is that you're good at, and what society most needs from an impact perspective. And this is all kind of similar to Huxley's book, Island, where he gives an optimistic future scenario for what society should be like in an ideal world. You, during school, you hone your skills, you start passion projects on the side, you really learn by doing. You know, you create businesses when you're in high school and college, and you know, they probably fail, but the purpose is to learn by doing. And you really choose yourself. You're not trying to position yourself as someone who someone else will want to hire. You choose yourself as almost like you're hiring yourself to be a sole proprietor of whatever it is you love to do and whatever the world needs and whatever you're good at. So take like Joe Rogan, for example. There's no one else who can do what he does because he is self-actualized to take all of his interests and passions and skills and turn them into little side businesses so, to support what he loves doing. You know, who else is a podcast interviewer who also is a UFC fight commentator and a, a hunting influencer and also someone who's deeply involved in health and fitness and supplements? You know, no one can do what he does. Same thing with Sam Harris, who really interested in meditation. So he started a meditation app and he's also an author because he likes to think the hard questions and he philosophizes publicly and interviews people on his podcast. Like no one can do what Sam Harris does. So if you take this to its extreme, every person can be almost like a god where they can do a tremendous amount themselves thanks to technology and, you know, the global interconnectedness of the workforce. And people will be able to build products without needing to know how to code. So there's this uh, company called Roblox, which is a video game where you can actually build other video games inside of that video game. And it's had tremendous valuations because it's almost like a fractal universe where this universe allows you to create infinite other universes. And I've seen this happening with a number of industries where you can just do so much as a person now and the barriers to entry are really lowering. So you can be someone who not only creates products, but also sells and markets those products to people through Facebook and Amazon and these tools that allow you to reach a huge portion of the human population just by clicking a few buttons. You'll be able to create works of art and write books and collaborate with people all over the world right from your living room. So this is already true for some people, but I think in the future it will be more the norm. There will obviously be a few massive winner-take-all companies, you know, companies like Apple and Amazon and Google, for the simple reason that that is the optimal from a consumer's perspective. Like, I wouldn't want to have to launch ads on a million different ad platforms. It's way easier for me to just go to Facebook and Google and manage everything from there. In the same way, you wouldn't want to go on you know, 15 different social media apps to connect with your friends. It's a lot easier if you just have one or two. So there are naturally these winner-take-all economies, and there will be a few major tech players and you know, also major banks, like just a few major players in each of these industries. But I believe in the best case, there will be a large number of scrappy creative startups that are really fulfilling all of the missing parts of the economy and creating a lot of interesting innovation and really providing sort of the spice of life. And, and I think that's always been sort of what America has been great at. And I think that's going to increase tremendously in the future. Now let's talk about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. For the worst case scenario, we should recognize the trends that are bad or pot uh, potentially troublesome that have been accelerated in the wake of COVID-19. So one, the perhaps the most worrisome one is all the displacement of workers. There was already some displacement of workers by automation. You know, Amazon was 
is creating factories that don't require anyone. You know, self-driving cars are becoming more real every day. Retail stores are not needing cashiers as stores like Amazon Go are spreading. But it really hadn't accelerated to the point where it was so worrisome before COVID. Now, because companies are really needing to cut costs and focus on profitability, the wave of automation is going to be much faster and much larger than it was previously. Another worrisome trend is that income inequality is accelerating. And part of that's because anytime there's a recession, the people who are most vulnerable get hurt the hardest. And most of the stimulation that happens from stimulus packages goes to people who already own equity, right? They, they stimulate the stock market, people who own stocks do better, but people who don't own stocks don't do any better. And same thing when you bail out businesses and offer a lot of tax incentives for businesses, you're helping people who have businesses, but you're not necessarily helping the employees or the contractors or the stay-at-home moms or, or people who don't aren't part of that world. So a lot of the stimulus that I'm seeing, yes, the $1,200 per person is good, but most of the stimulus is going to people who already have assets. So I worry that income inequality will accelerate and be even greater in the next few years than it has been in the past few years. Also, the debt burden has been soaring. So, you know, we're, we're adding trillions of dollars to the national debt in order to, uh, you know, deliver these stimulus packages. And that's always a concern because the US dollar could be devalued. I think it's perhaps more worrisome for other countries' currencies since the US dollar is a big reserve currency in the free world. But it's still something we need to keep an eye on. I've also noticed that there's a shift away from globalism and towards nationalism. So it used to be the case that it was all about, you know, we're one global economy, we're all in this together, we got to fight climate change and diseases and everything together. This was definitely the case during, you know, Obama's presidency when we passed the Paris Climate Accords. Now we are seriously shifting towards nationalism, where it's all about countries fighting amongst themselves for test kits and vaccines and masks and we can't count on China for our supply chain, so we need to have other providers so our nation is secure. You know, Britain exited the EU, it's possible other countries would exit the EU. And in general, we're just seeing more of a move towards countries focusing on their own people first and then focusing on the international community second. That's worrisome and that can create a fertile ground for conflict. The other trend that I'm seeing that's worrisome is just mental health and addiction. People staying home all the time is straining relationships, and it's also straining people who already are perhaps lonely or depressed or have some addictive tendencies. You know, are you just going to watch TV all day or are you going to actually do something productive? That's a question people have to deal with every single day of lockdown, and it's going to continue to be a question after the lockdown is lifted. So in my worst case scenario, this is a very bad situation for the vast majority of job seekers, and it will really only be the people who are able to adapt quickly uh, in this new paradigm who will survive and flourish. Now let's talk about the most likely scenario. The most likely scenario is really all about you, what you decide to do given everything that's changing. So rather than our typical most likely scenario, I want to ask you questions, you the listener, that you can ponder and think about what the answer is to help you prepare for the future of work. Most likely scenario. There's this really great book by Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. We talk about it a lot in the Future of Persuasion episode, if you want to check that out. But one interesting framework that they provide in that book is they say any person who 
you're dealing with in a negotiation, they typically fall into one of three buckets. Either they're an analyst, an assertive, or an accommodator. So an analyst would be someone like Bill Gates. If you're gonna convince Bill Gates to support your cause or your business, you better have a detailed, you know, detailed charts and data that really proves that this is real, that this is going to make a difference. That's the type of person he is. He's an analyst. He makes decisions based on data. Or you might be dealing with someone who's an assertive type. So someone like, let's say, Mark Cuban. You know, Mark Cuban is going to tell you exactly what he thinks. And until he's fully said what he needs to say, it's unlikely he'll listen to what you have to say. So when you're dealing with someone who's an assertive, you have to show them respect. You have to defer to them to some sense. And you have to show them that you can stick up for yourself and you're someone who can get things done and move and shake. You also may be dealing with an accommodator. An accommodator is like a schmoozer, someone who is really good at dealing with people as a way of getting them to do what they want. So an accommodator may be like Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank or Sheryl Sandberg, you know, someone who's all about relationships. And for accommodators, you need to really show them that you're a human being, you know, I'm a human being, you're a human being. We have these same sort of experiences that we both relate to. Therefore, let's do business together. So I would look at yourself, recognize which type of persuader you are, and then think about how you should interact with other types of persuaders to be most effective at your job or whatever your goal is in life. Another question I would ask you, the listener, how's your talent stack? Scott Adams has this interesting Uh, idea called a talent stack, which is basically the stack of all the talents you have that are valuable in the job market. So there are some talent stacks that are specific to a certain job. You know, like if you're really good at CAD, that's important for architecture, where you can actually create business, you know, models of buildings in 3D using software programs. But there are a lot of talent stacks that are valuable no matter what your job is. So for instance, public speaking is always gonna be important. You're always gonna have to advocate for yourself. Likewise, persuasion is always gonna be important. Being able to persuade people to take on your perspective and to do things in the way that you feel they need to be done. Also writing and written communication is so important. That's one of the most difficult areas for me to hire people for noble growth is finding people who are really good writers. Also design, you know, no matter what you're doing, even if you're a pure business guy, you're going to need to create slide decks and they better look good aesthetically if you're going to be successful. I would also say an understanding of analytics and statistics and just basic numbers, the scientific method is also very important. And increasingly media creation and navigating the media landscape and giving yourself a valuable Uh, high quality information feed is also really important. So think about your own talent stack and how you can improve your talent stack. What areas are you lacking? What are your strong suits? And I would say focus more on making your strong suits even stronger while making sure you don't have a major shortage in any of the other areas that I've outlined. Another question I would ask you is, Who are the five people you spend the most time with? There's that famous saying that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I would really consider who those people are and what each of their persuasive styles are, analyst, assertive, or accommodator, and whether they are, from a personality trait perspective, a hacker, a hipster, or a hustler. And think about which of these people would be good to collaborate with and which of these people maybe you shouldn't have in your life, maybe if they're a bad, a bad influence. And even if you just continue to have a relationship with them that has nothing to do with work, I still find it valuable to recognize these traits in different people in your life so you can start to recognize that in other people who you interact with in the job market. Another question is, there are two questions that I ask every job candidate at Noble Growth. And they are the following. 
what would you do if you already had $10 million in the bank? What would you do all day to spend your time? And then also, what would you do to put food on the table if you had $0 in the bank? So imagine in the first scenario, you wake up tomorrow and you have $10 million in the bank. What do you actually do every day? How do you spend your time? What's worth it to you if you no longer need to make a living? Answering that question will help you understand what it is you really love to do, aside from what's going to help you make money. And the second question of what would you do to actually put food on the table and not be homeless if you woke up tomorrow and zero dollars in the bank? That's this question, if you answer it, will help you recognize what skills are really most valuable and most immediately marketable at this current time. I would also ask you, who would you ideally want to collaborate with? This could be your ideal company, like, wow, I would just really love to work for Tesla or, or whoever it is. Also, any people, maybe there's some people in your life, maybe you don't even know them that well, but you always thought, wow, that person's really thoughtful and smart, and I'd love to collaborate with them someday. And, you know, I have this business idea, maybe they'd be willing to talk about it with me. If so, you should talk about it with them. Explore all areas. You never know what's going to happen if you reach out to someone. I would also ask, what problems are most meaningful to you? Is solving climate change important to you? Is creating beneficial AI important to you? Is helping other people find jobs and success in this difficult economy important to you? Maybe helping people with mental health issues? Maybe fighting for justice and you know criminal justice reform? Maybe it's fighting for truth or creating beauty? Whatever is most important to you, Follow that and really tap into that in the deepest level possible. That will give you the greatest chance of success. And the last question I'll ask you, which I'll leave you with, is who are you really? Not who are you, the person that other people see, but who are you in your innermost sense? And there's this incredible book by Douglas Harding called On Having No Head, and he gives this meditative thought experiment where if you imagine what it's like to live in the world where you see through your heart rather than seeing out of your eyes and you forget that you even have a face or that you have a head and you really focus on the reality of who you are which is a space for the world to exist in Douglas Harding's words and there's a little meditative exercise I can have you go through right now that may help you understand what I'm trying to say. So close your eyes, take a deep breath. Now open your eyes and look out at the world. Recognize what your field of vision looks like. You're able to see in this sort of oval shape, it sort of fades off in the edges. You can't actually see your head. You might be able to see a little bit of your nose. You can see your hands if you stick them out. But you can't see your actual head. You can't see yourself. And when you focus on looking out in the world, recognize that these are all just the contents of consciousness. They are what your brain is creating based on the inputs that you're experiencing. Now, turn that focus inward and try to look back at the one who is looking and when this happens to me when I do this I feel like a shiver go through my body when I really focus on looking back at myself and realize that you're not what your face looks like you're not what your body looks like you are just a space in which consciousness appears and if you follow your heart in the sense that Doug, Douglas Harding means where you go through life almost as if you're shining through your heart rather than looking out through your eyes, that will help you naturally be drawn to what you should be doing in your life, what you want to be doing, what society needs. And I was recently posting on my Instagram, uh, you know, I'd answer any philosophical question people had. And one person asked if I believe in God and my answer is that, yes, I believe in God if you mean the summation of all beings and non-beings. Because just like how our cells 
operate seemingly independently from one another, but collectively they make up a greater being, which is us. We are like, you know, we humans are like cells and part of some greater being that we can't even fathom. So you could call that God, but it's, it's not some separate God that's ruling from afar. Rather, it's God is the summation of all of us. And we're just like one little ant who can't really recognize what the purpose of the entire anthill is. But if you really tap into that Douglas Harding sense of seeing the world through your heart rather than through your head, and just trusting in your own path and doing well by others and trusting in the network that if you do well by others and do well by the network, the network will reward you because it'll recognize that you're a good person to do business with. If you live your life in this way and you follow the headless way, I have no doubt that you will find success in this world. That doesn't mean you don't need to keep up with the latest tools and constantly be learning and evolving and adapting. But I really think that this is the greatest determinant of whether people will succeed in the new world. Are you going to self-actualize and really figure out what it is that's unique about you and become more like Joe Rogan or Sam Harris or Elon Musk or one of these people that just creates any sort of business based on whatever is fun and interesting and important to them? If you can do that in your own life, you will succeed and the new future of work will be positive for you. So today's a new day. The most likely scenario for the new future of work is dependent on you and what you do now and in the future. Thank you so much for listening, not just to this episode, but if you've listened to other episodes in the past, uh, it really means a lot to me. This is my favorite part of the week where I get to communicate with you. And even though it's one-sided where I'm, I'm talking and you're listening, it feels like a two-sided communication because I hear from you guys sometimes, I read your reviews, and I really just love the community that we've built here. So we're all in this together, we'll get through this together. This has been the new future of work. And I hope to see you next week. And what will Thanks for tuning in. Happen. The past, the present, and the future.